1994. Lance Armstrong debuted his world champion stripes with the goal of winning the most important classics of the season. However, some Italian men in blue, inspired by the good doctor, Michele Ferrari himself, would prevent him and most of the rest of the peloton from winning much of note in that spring. The most prominent amongst them was a 23-year-old Russian rider named Yevgeny Berzin, who until that season was a complete unknown. However, despite this, he even went on to win a Giro d'Italia from the great Miguel Indurain. Do you want to know how the Hijo de Putin conquered the world in the spring of 1994? Well, without further ado, let the show begin. Yevgeny Berzin was another one of those Soviet talents who could not leave his country until David Hasselhoff was heard in Berlin belting out his song, Looking for Freedom. In this case, we are talking about a track specialist who at only 20 years of age had been the amateur world champion in the pursuit discipline. A promising young rider who had signed for Macaire Balan in 1993. This was an Italian team that came to prominence in the Giro that year with the former world champion Moreno Argentin and his former compatriot Ugramov, a terror of the mountains who ended up taking second place that year behind Big Mig. At the same time, the team had signed a peculiar hawk looking Italian doctor who had studied with Professor Conconi. We are talking here about the then young Michele Ferrari, who knew that with his tricks and magic, he could go a long way to turning a donkey into a prize racehorse. And his first experiment? Yevgeny Berzin in 1994. The Russian rider, who had finished 90th in the previous Giro, had achieved test rider status now within the team, which was now renamed Giwis Balan. Ferrari had trained with the blonde haired, blue eyed youngster and he treated him with great love and care. He tuned him up to top condition and Yevgeny was hungry and classy enough to win in every kind of scenario and competition. Already in his debut in the French Tour of the Mediterranean, he managed to finish in second place, combining spectacular form in the time trial with good endurance in the mountains. This was also seen in different races of the Italian Championship, such as in the Terreno Adriatico, where he finished second behind his teammate Giorgio Ferlan, or in another race whose name I can't pronounce where, as you can see in the images, he had to settle for third place behind the Danish rider Rolf Sorensen in the sprint. Something strange was cooking in the Italian lasagna, and especially in the Ferrari factory, because the Givas team just could not stop winning. In March, Giorgio Furlan backed it all up by winning the Milan San Remo solo, after a spectacular attack on the Poggio that even the oldest fans in the bars still remember as being the greatest ET performance that they'd ever seen in their lives. Evgeny Berzin took over from Furlan and he continued to tear up the cycling calendar. He achieved his first professional triumph by winning a time trial at the Criterium International, ahead of none other than the Vuelta a Spanian champion Tony Rominger. And from there he went to the Vuelta a Pai Basco to fight against the Swiss rider again who was also tuned up by the same Italian medical mechanic, Michele Ferrari. In Oscali though, he could not win this time, but he finished the competition in an excellent second position, ahead of climbers of repute such as Claudio Chiapucci and Francesco Casagrande. The youngster from Emanuele Bombini's team was surprising the cycling world. His regularity since February was impressive, but when he really amazed the world was in April and May starting in the Liège Baston Liège, one of the monuments of cycling and one of the most important competitions of the year. The big favourite was Tony Rominger. Poised and ready to sweep the Vuelta a España, which was still at that time being held in April. But as soon as the Mapai rider launched the powerful attack with 90 kilometers to go, the Russian jumped on his wheel, totally unchained and now ready to let loose. After several attempts by Rominger himself, Claudio Chiapucci and world champion Lance Armstrong to go solo, Berzin made his move. In a moment of indecision of his rivals, with 22 kilometers to go to the finish line, and after a puncture of Rominger, Berzin attacked, and he had gone solo, while behind Giorgio Furlan was the anchor. 
making it such that Armstrong or Kiyopuchi did not go after the Russian. He had succeeded. Borzin had won Liège in his first attempt at the race, and ahead of Lance as well, while the public rubbed their eyes in disbelief. However, just a few days later, the most Dante-esque event in cycling history occurred. The performance itself probably deserves a video of its own, so we'll just try to summarise it here in a few seconds. It was at the Flesh Wallon that Yevgeny Burzin attacks on the second of three passes over the Murdoi. It is still 50 kilometers from the finish line. He is joined by no less than two of his teammates, the very much veteran Moreno Argentin, and again the radioactive Giorgio Ferlan. The trio took over on the undulating terrain, and they arrived at the top of the moor together. Between them, they gave the win to the 34-year-old rider. Amberzin, who had worked the hardest of the three, came in third. Nobody could believe it. The podium of one of the most important classics of the calendar was taken by three riders from the same team. Well, Michele Ferrari was asked about this afterwards. Asked if he feared the use of EPO in the peloton, the Italian himself assured the world that EPO was not dangerous unless it was taken in excess, just like orange juice. Unbelievable, but true. These were times in which doping was talked about openly, as you can see. But the Brazil show didn't end there. He had a new goal in mind, the Giro d'Italia. It seemed like an insurmountable task, because Miguel Indurain had won the last two editions, and the route this year was also quite favourable for his attributes again, with as many as three time trials. But Berzin had it clear. Sitting in his Ferrari, he could be the fastest in the peloton. On the first day, he finished ahead of the Spaniard from Benesto in the short time trial, and his show would continue. The next day, his teammate Argentin won the first undulating finish, and Brazil himself was amongst the top three riders in the Giro. Two days later, at the first high finish at Campaneo Matese, the Russian Gibas rider made a delicious attack a few kilometres from the finish line, allowing him the luxury of taking almost one minute off the leading group on what on paper was a not too hard day. However, it was in the 44 km Fionica time trial that Brazil blew everyone away. Spanish champion Miguel Indurain hadn't lost a time trial in the Grand Tour since 1991, except for one occasion, but this time he was annihilated. At more than 50.7 km per hour on average, Brazil won, and he put a gap of almost 3 minutes into Big Mig on the day. The Spanish media protected their champion. They thought he was in bad shape, but at no time did they think that Berzin was a real winning machine. But from then on, he just held his own in the mountains. Despite the furious attacks of the then young Marco Pantani in the legendary Africa stage. When he also won the second time trial on the Paso de Boca, taking another 20 seconds from Indurain and more than a minute and a half from Pantani, the result was clear. Berzin had won the Giro and ahead of two cycling legends, Marco Pantani and Miguel Indurain. He had reached the zenith of his career, a place where he never went again, partially because of his laziness and his lack of effort, and partially because there had never been a team as well prepared medically as the Gibbs Balan team, a team that had increased Berzin's natural hemocrit level from 41 to 53 points, as if nothing had happened. <laughs>